More than 300 years ago, Galileo invented the telescope and brought man and the stars closer together. For today's young scientist, this Gilbert 60 power spotting telescope. So turn your sound up if you need to hear this, people. Including an image that's right side up. A new addition to the Gilbert family of telescopes, this beauty can bring in close ups of aircraft, birds, or ships at sea. The 40 power telescope in this attractive box has a reflecting lens system for overhead viewing and a steel mounting clamp. This 60 power reflecting telescope brings in close up views of the moon and its craters, of Mars, Jupiter, and Venus. With its rack and pinion focusing system, images are razor sharp. Queen of the Gilbert Astronomy Line is this 80 power deluxe telescope that brings new excitement to space travel. This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. Uh, what we were watching was a 1961 video of, uh, from the A.C. Gilbert Company. Uh, A.C. Gilbert made lots of telescopes and microscopes. Um, if you were a kid back in the 60s, you might have also had something called an erector set, which was like a steel uh, building uh, uh, toy. Uh, I had one as a kid. A lot of my friends, though, had Gilbert telescopes, um, and many of those, uh, those, those guys went on to get STEM careers. Uh, one of them, a uh, dear friend, Mike Reynolds, always talked about his beloved Gilbert uh, reflector that uh, had like, uh, you know, just the cheapest glass and, and materials, but uh, it launched a science career for him that took him all the way to being trained as a NASA astronaut for the Teachers in Space program. Uh, Mike Reynolds uh, was someone who wrote books on astronomy uh, and taught astronomy at, uh, uh, in um, uh, Florida, so it was Teacher of the Year at one point. Anyhow, you just never know where a small telescope might take you. Um, but uh, uh, this week, uh, Kent Martz uh, comes back from Fort Worth Camera where he uh, and Tyler went to uh, a special event called PhotoFest. Uh, of course, Fort Worth Camera is an Explore scientific dealer as well, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. But Kent wants to talk about how to get your first telescope and uh, show what happened at Fort Worth PhotoFest. Yes, yeah, so here we go. Let me uh, share my screen. See if I can share the right screen and share the sound. Here we go. Looks like we're up and running. All right, so. You know, uh, we didn't know what to expect. This is our first show since COVID. And really, you know, I've not been to a lot of shows. And uh, uh, we were able to uh, go down to Fort Worth. It's a six-hour drive away. So, you know, a one-day drive. And one of our closest dealers uh, that has a store, and they've only been uh, a dealer for, well, right at two months now, and have done very well with our first light series of telescopes. And they invited us down. So, uh, this is the picture of the crowd that was waiting at 8.45 uh, to open the doors at 9 o'clock. Now, granted, this was a camera store. Most of the people, all the people were coming for, 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 for cameras. and um, But quite a crowd there. I was really impressed with the crowd that showed up. And uh, this is a video. Let me see if I can start this. Turn your volume up. I think you should be able to hear this. But here you go. What are you seeing? I see the sun. I see all the dark spots on it. What happened? Hang on. 
the solar solar spots on it and it's so clear i just can't believe how clear it is like it's so sharp have you ever seen the sun before i've never seen the sun oh i'm the old pictures <laughs> only in pictures is this better than pictures this is a hundred times better than pictures i mean i'm seeing it directly with my own two eyes directly there's this is not an image this is not a screen i mean i'm seeing it in real time in real time that's so that is so dope that is so cool i gotta get me one what's your name javier where are you from, Javier? I am from Fort Worth, Texas. And where are you? I am at Fort Worth Camera enjoying this amazing event with you guys. This is awesome. I can't even stop looking at that. Oh, wow. That's so cool. <laughs> so that was so cool. He was just excited beyond belief. Uh, we were had the 120-millimeter uh, uh, giant binoculars set up with a uh, custom-made solar or sun catcher with our solar film and uh it was the star of the show a uh, couple of hundred people probably looked through the telescope over the course of the event and uh you know it's invariably hard to take pictures you know uh to get a good one just handheld but here's a picture i took with my smartphone of what they were seeing and you know there's a whole bunch of sunspots that aren't showing up here but this little complex right here was just fantastic, Scott. And right. there was clearly two bands, the standard two bands of sunspots showing up. And, you know, I, if people have, oh, you this know. This is just shooting through the eyepiece, right? Yeah, this is just a focal shooting through the eyepiece. And uh, it was a really nice view. People would look in there, Scott, and go, oh, it looks three-dimensional. And I'd laugh and I'd say, well, that's because it is three-dimensional. You're right. looking through binoculars and you're getting a right. binocular view and getting a three-dimensional view of it. And uh, sunspots were all over and uh, just a cool view. Uh, and here is another picture. Uh, you can see Tyler there in the background. Um, and that's an Exos 100 with an uh, ED80 uh, setting on it. <clears throat> and... Uh, we, uh, Tyler and I used the uh, compass method to align it, Scott. And so literally uh, mm -hmm. used the compass, stood back there about where the guy in the background is using a compass on an iPhone. Okay. And, and we just lined it up and I kept telling Tyler, oh, rotate it counterclockwise a little bit, a little bit more. We leveled it, still made sure it was aligned again. And then he did a slew to the sun and Scott, we nailed the polar alignment. Oh, that's great. It it tracked the sun. I couldn't uh -huh. believe it. It stayed in. It finally started drifting after about five hours. It finally started drifting. And we just sat there and let it run using our power bank flashlight and, and uh, an iPad to control it. Uh, and we, you know, did a, I was amazed. Even after we did a meridian flip, Scott, it was still went right back to it. Yeah. And, you know, okay, so people might ask, how do you do a meridian flip if they're familiar with astrophotography? Explore Stars does not have a meridian flip function. However, you can cheat because after the telescope gets past the meridian a little bit, you can simply say, go to the sun, and it's going to use the go-to function of this mount, and it's going to flip and do a meridian. It's going to go to the sun. It knows it's past the meridian, so it's going to execute a meridian flip. Even so after... A what's the advantage of a meridian flip? Uh, the advantage of a meridian flip is after a while, when if it's pointing to the east, so the telescope's on the west side of the mount, it's going to rotate past the meridian and keep getting lower and lower and lower on the bottom of the rotational axis. So it's going to turn upside down, if you will. Uh, so you're going to execute a meridian flip to get it back around to where the telescope's back on top again. Um, you know, I, honestly, instead of the telescope appearing like it's up underneath and the counterweights are up in the sky. That's right? correct. Yes, okay. absolutely. And depending on where the telescope's <laughs> pointing at that point, uh, based on the declination, uh, axis, it actually could run into a leg of the telescope. Uh, which is probably the primary reason to do it. But uh, because we're the way the telescope and the sun were aligned, 
it, it was able to get pretty low. I don't think it would have hit a tripod leg, but, uh, I, literally, Scott, it was finally about three o'clock. I started having to adjust the declination. Uh, was it declination? No, it was the altitude just a little bit because it was starting to drift off to one yeah, side so you were just really a little close bit. close to polar alignment. That's great. And just and doing that broad daylight. Broad daylight. And sometimes a blind hog finds a nut, and I found a nut that day. I was really worried about having to fine tune it and get it going. So, you know, uh, we had uh, set up in the store a Exos 100 with a uh, our camera dovetail, and that attracted a lot of attention, Scott. There was people uh, coming up and looking at it. We, we borrowed a camera from the store and put a camera on it and talked to dozens of people about the benefits of doing astrophotography, and they were all interested in it, and uh, I suspect the store is going to sell a number of ixos 100s were the, uh were the people were the people amateur astronomers or were they just most most of them photographers? are just photographers uh okay. you know he's only had the line of telescopes for like i said two months he sold a decent more than he expected in the first two months yeah. with you know only some you know social media advertising uh most of the people were right by the front door said so see us when they'd come in and then they'd go make their purchases and then come talk to us. And, you know, they came in to spend, you know, I mean, there's, there were some people dropping six, $8,000, um, uh, you know, on cameras and lenses and stuff. And, uh, uh, I think they'd spent their money, but they were really intrigued by the ability to take pictures mm -hmm. of, you know, the Milky way with a go-to tracker. Uh, we had Wade, Prunties um, printed out as probably a three by five print hanging up there, and would say, and that picture was taken with this mount and even yeah. a smaller telescope. And they were like, really? And it's like, so yeah, you mean really. Three foot by five foot, not, not a three by five. Yeah, three foot by five foot. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not three by five inch, three foot by five three foot by five foot uh yeah. print of weight now and okay. i don't have access to that but yeah but small that was, prints used to be three and a half by five yeah i know inches. five yeah i know right? exactly i made <laughs> i made lots of three and a half by fives i bet you did you I know bet you did and still have stacks of them from those days but uh <clears throat> wade's picture you know wade after a month took spent a hundred hours doing data capture of the north american nebula and people we we talked a lot to people about how to do astrophotography and narrowband imaging and why it works and the process to go through it. And, you know, we couldn't do astrophotography, but this guy right here was like, well, can I use that to take pictures? And we we're like, yeah, sure. And so he went and got his camera and put it on there and he had an intervalometer. And so he was controlling his camera with that thing in his left hand. And taking heat sprint probably 30 minutes there, taking pictures um, of the sun awesome. uh, using using our solar safe sun catcher filter, which, you know, fits about any optic, whether it's a camera lens or a telescope or even a pair of binoculars, as we showed. So they had a great time and he took he took some, he got some really nice pictures. Uh, it was bright and he was having it was it's hard to focus on the sun. And he was working at it. And I think he could zoom in and have that flip down screen. And, and he got some on the visual back, some pretty good pictures of the sun. So uh, he was very excited about that as well. So uh, we were able to uh, do a lot of work. And here's a picture I got. I, I, really, I saw, I turned around and had been talking to somebody. And T Tyler was uh, texting his wife, I believe. And there was nobody out there. And I just saw that and I thought, oh, that's a nice little picture. So focused on the front door uh, sign and uh, got Tyler out in the background. You can see the rig out there. So, sure. you know, um, a couple of people bought telescopes and upgraded some eyepieces. Uh, so it was uh, a good event. Uh, the management team of... Um, uh, Fort Worth camera was really excited. And in fact, one of their people this morning 
uh, sent me an order for uh, an Exos 100 with an azimuth adjuster plate, uh, a power bank flashlight, and an extra counterweight uh, for one of the employees who, who an, loved it so employee. much for an oh, employee. Right. And so he had already bought an ED80, and then he saw this, and he's 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 just excited as can be. Well, that's and uh, well, that's you kind know, of what it takes, you know, you get someone that is in a store. Now, this is really, I mean, hits home for me because this is almost exactly how OPT started. You know, it was a camera shop. I'm working at this store. Um, you know, I'm a photographer, and uh, it was just, um, uh, you know, once we got into telescopes and I started renewing my interest in astronomy, uh, wow, it just, it just exploded, you know, so. And, yeah, so. Uh, the, the store still, of course, still exists today. Yeah, so, so do they still have a storefront? No, they don't. No. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a there's a front, but. <laughs> but they don't have a display. They, they don't have a they store. Don't, they don't do it in the traditional old way uh, like Fort Worth Camera does. You know, yeah. when you walk into the store and you got a showroom and all the rest of it. They have adopted a more, you know, e-commerce digital model. Although I think you can make an appointment uh, to go okay. in and see product. You yeah. Know, so. so Fort Worth Camera is an old school. They have a dark room. They make prints. They have a, a side business called the Print Refinery, where they make, you know, can make really big prints and do a lot of custom work for people. Sort of, sort of like uh, the printer we have here, Scott. But yeah. theirs is a much more photo quality print than ours is although our big printer is really good and we can make longer longer ones than they can make so uh you know had lots of questions about uh what you can see how telescopes work um you know uh light pollution got a chance to talk about light pollution and a number of people a, a serious percentage of the people we talked to were aware of light pollution and Mm -hmm. knew about light pollution and bird problems and insects and fireflies and that you can't see the Milky Way from from even a fairly good significance outside of Fort Worth, you know. And the eclipse is going to be big for them because they are very close to the center line or very close to totality and right. just just south of Fort Worth. For the 2024 it, eclipse, right? For the 2024 total eclipse. And uh, they're gearing up for it. And we had conversations about solar filters and telescopes and, you know, what we can do for them when it's that time to sell uh, that, you know, uh, start doing eclipse glasses and fo solar filters and things like that. Sure. So, yeah. So people are aware of the eclipse and uh, it's going to start, we're what, a year and a half away? Right. And, yeah. We're a year and a half out. Oh, yeah, it's around is, the corner. Yeah, which is which is, corner, which is yeah. three or four months away in reality. Yeah. It'll seem like. Yeah. So anyway, so but it was it was really good. People were asking a lot of really good questions. Of course, everybody there was a photographer, right? They are already aware of focal yeah. length and things like that, and were able to compare an ED80 to their tele to their photo telephoto lens, mm -hmm. and that gave me the ability to talk about why you know well, the telescope. Isn't going to have chromatic aberration. It's not going to have, you know, uh, coma nearly like a lot of uh, camera lenses do. Right. And and they were aware of you know field curvature and coma and all that stuff and the effects of full frame versus crop sensors and you know it was, a, it was an educated audience that was really engaged in the idea of astrophotography, uh, which the general manager had told me. Uh, basically not a day goes by that somebody does not ask them about how to do astrophotography. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited that one of the guys, one of the staff, I don't want to use <clears throat> gender. It doesn't matter. One of the staff members is really interested in the Exos 100. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause that means he's going to be able to demonstrate it to people there and have that enthusiasm that we bring, but we're not there. So anyway, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. It, you know, and it was, and Tyler got to stop at a Bucky's. I don't know if you ever been to a Bucky's or yeah, not. Yeah, I've been to a Bucky's. Yeah, Bucky's. I was <laughs> told it was going to gas was station. It's a, it's a three ring circus gas station with they're huge, and uh, I don't know the yeah, one I was in like, might have been sixty thousand square feet or something. You know. Yeah, it's it's, it's they're 
the giant to have 80 this one has i think 80 gas pumps yeah you know uh so that's 80 gas 80, 80 pumps 80 which means there's 160 slots right i mean it was really impressive yeah you know so, and uh, harold wants to know do they have good visuals for displays there kent good visuals uh, it's a standard camera shop you know they carry bags and tripods and they have a probably a eight foot long section literally by the front doors uh for people to see they're they're not hiding mm -hmm. it back in the back mm -hmm. they want to, they want people to see those telescopes you walk in the door they are right there on the right and you can see them when you're coming in the front doors so uh uh they're all in on on right. telescopes i think they're going to do well with it so let's let's talk a little bit about getting your first telescope, Kent. Uh, yep. You had you had people that were coming in the store, uh, and you mentioned that uh, a lot of them are photographers, so they understand optics already. You know, you were right. You know, it's it's easy to tell them like the ED80, for example, is a 480 millimeter f6 telephoto lens. Right. Okay? Absolutely. That, that's, you... There's really no difference. Uh, the only difference usually on telescope lenses and camera lenses is that you already have the bayonet mount to mount the camera onto it and there would be an aperture so you could stop it down, okay? Uh, maybe a, a helical focus for turning the focuser instead of a focus wheel in the back. But uh, those are minor points. The big thing about telescopes versus camera lenses is that usually a telescope has much better correction, optical correction, mm -hmm. uh, and is really designed uh, uh, to give you true diffraction limited performance. Where a lot of camera lenses, they're photographing what? Buildings, people, uh, animals, right. uh, beach scenes, stuff like that. They're not photographing pinpoints of light like amateur astronomers are. Right. And so we had- Optical correction does not have to be as good if had that discussion lenses is they have to be in telescope lenses had which, that discussion and then you then you take you take the the price the selling price of a camera lens let's just take um, some of Can canon's top lenses for example oh six eight thousand dollars yeah versus maybe eight hundred to a thousand or two thousand dollars yeah well you look right? at their their uh their 600 millimeter uh sports camera i think retails for sixty five hundred dollars or something like that yeah which gets and you photographers are used to spending that kind of money all the time yeah. in the amateur astronomy world you get an incredible deal okay an incredible deal not just from explore scientific but from everybody Celestron and all the other telescope makers that are out there they're making unbelievably high-end super corrected optics that's great for just even regular photography for what I think is a steal, you know, right. especially when you compare it, what camera companies sell for. And it, and you also look at something like Canon, for example, they make much more quantities than, than, uh, than the telescope makers do, uh, yet they do sell for typically a lot more money. So it's, just, yep. You know. um, I'm gonna look up this Canon. Canon 600 millimeter. Um, here's a. Yeah, that's getting it dipped. You're looking at. The. Oh, Scott, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I didn't What's look that? at. The uh, Canon RF 600 F4 lens, image stabilized, sells for thirteen thousand uh, dollars. Image stabilized <laughs> sells for thirteen thousand. Wow. Yeah. Well, all all the camera lenses now, new camera lenses, top line camera lenses are image stabilized. Mm -hmm. So you know, which is something you don't need for astrophotography. No. And, and we did have conversation with a couple of people about using it for for. For photography, and I, and I told the problem is that there's no autofocus like you're used to. So you got to focus, focuser. Oh, you got to focus. Yeah, and, and so, <laughs> and so I, they, I said, here's how you do bird photography. You you watch where the birds want to be, 
And then you focus right where the birds are landing and wait for the bird to land to take a picture. Right. Or you put out some bird seed and then, and then crop off, you know, trim some branches and you just, you know, take pictures. And I said, if you're really into it, you get a piece of photographic glass and replace a pane in your door or make a hole in your wall and make a portal and shoot through the glass or go outside and do it. And they were sure. really intrigued by that idea. And um, I uh, uh, showed them a couple of photos uh, that Sheldon uh, has taken uh, of, of really, really tight close-ups. And they were just amazed at the detail that a, they were able to get with a telescope versus a camera lens, you know? So anyway, but how do you decide what first telescope you're going to get? There's so many options out there. The best way, and I told lots of people this, is to find an astronomy club and go to their meetings and go to their star parties and use their gear and find out what you like. Don't be in a hurry necessarily to buy something because you may find out you love planetary photography or looking at planets and can care less about nebula and, 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 and galaxies or vice versa. You love galaxies. You don't care about planets. You got to buy the right tool for the job. And we had that conversation a lot as well. I wish we would have had Dobsonian telescopes in stock, Scott, yeah. because I think we would have sold because Dobbs are so easy to use. They're, they are really a dynamite for yeah. beginners telescope. Yeah. If you're going to really kind of jump into the deep end to look at deep sky objects, you know. But, and we're, we're talking about jumping to the deep end. We're only talking about dumping in the Jeep, jumping to the deep end for less than $1,000. Not, not in price. Not in right. price. The deep, right. deep end as far as um, uh, trying to see visually uh, amazing stuff. Or if your name is, uh, is uh, Nico the Hammer, <laughs> who makes incredible astrophotography with his unguided, untracking, no electronics Dobsonian telescope. You know what? What camera does he use? Does, is he using a, a, a DSLR? Is he using a, a dedicated astro cam? I think you he, know. I think he actually does have an inexpensive dedicated astro cam. Yeah, and he takes lots of short exposures, many probably hundreds of very hundreds of thousands. Exposures. And then and then tracks and stacks them and gets incredible results, you know. So he has to work with it a little bit, but uh, he has the pride of knowing that uh, a lot of times his astro photographs beat a lot of other people's work, uh, even though they bought some pretty expensive gear. Yeah, so. yeah. So you know, if you're gonna buy something, um, you know. Plan to spend three to five hundred dollars if you're just going to buy a telescope. You know there are some great small telescopes out there, and Scott has one you can see over his left shoulder back there, his Kmart I telescope. Got, that would have my Kmart. Yeah, that would have so cost. This, this was the competitor to Gilbert. Okay, was Kmart's focal uh, telescopes, and this is a mint condition, uh, nineteen seventy era. Um, uh, you know, 40 millimeter refractor. This is my first telescope. And, and so what year, 1960, 1970, 1970. And yeah, what'd yeah. your mom and dad pay for it? $17.50. And it was to them a pretty expensive Christmas gift, you know? So uh, that's $133 and 85 cents today. Yeah. In today, do right. today's dollars to put in perspective. And they bought that for a 10 year old kid, right? You know, yeah, a hundred year old kid. And they didn't know if I would like it or not. My 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 uh, stepdad uh, was working at LTV, and LTV made some of the parts for the uh, Apollo, um, uh, you know, uh, spacesuits. They were making spacesuit parts, and um, so he got to talk to a lot of scientists and engineer types and stuff like that. And they all recommended start him off with a refractor. You know, so. So there you go. You know, it's my first telescope, and uh, um, I keep it on my desk because just like Mike Reynolds, who went on to be uh, training as an astronaut and, uh, you know, the teachers in space program, uh, that little telescope kind of launched, helped.
helped launch a career for me in uh, amateur astronomy, you know, so, and the adventures and stuff that I've had, uh, and that we all have is, you know, if you stay active in amateur astronomy, you're going to have some pretty mind-blowing experiences, not only from things that happen in the sky, but the people you're going to meet, so. All right, so talk about mind-blowing experiences, Scott. Okay. You know, I've talked about for the last years that we haven't had a meteor storm in a couple of decades. Right. Right. I mean, that we've just not had one. Well, guess what? Somewhere around midnight, the night of the 30th of May. Okay. Primed for North America is the Ta Herculeids which Scott, you probably haven't even heard of. I hadn't. However, there's a peak forecast to happen at 504 universal uh, time coordinated, uh, which works out to be for central daylight time, that's 12.04 a.m. And there's multiple models and they're all pointing to a 22 minute time span around that time. Uh, they're expected to be visible naked eye. They're small and going to be slow. So you need to get to a dark site to see them. Um, uh, it's going to be coming out of the part of the sky occupied by Leo. Uh, and actually the comet is, that made it is actually visible up there right now, but there's possibility of potentially hundreds per hour. Um, so uh, the history article I'm reading about it says, it's un in the un unlikely event that things line up just right because there's this clump of cometary debris that they've identified and outbursts mm -hmm. of up to 1,000 meteors per hour may be possible. I've seen it one time. We we're up uh, at Todd Longnecker's house uh, back, I don't know, in the late 90s. <laughs> and uh, before there's increased the light pollution, so you're talking about over 20 years ago, or right at 20 years ago and we set up all night it was cold and all of a sudden about three in the morning the sky just opened up and scott there were so many meters you you could it was impossible to count and so we'd just estimate you know what we saw in 10 seconds and it was thousands per hour and it wow. went on for about 45 minutes and then wow. it just turned off and uh we still talk about it our boys still talk about it. Uh, they remember it was really cold and the sky was literally a blaze with, with meteors. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to be, if all the pieces fall together, it'll be fantastic. If not, you got to stay up till 1230 or one o'clock looking for whatever you get to see. And if you get to see a few, Hey, you got to see a few, but this is one. And the reality is, Chances are it's going to be a fizzle, right? But if it's not, if you it's don't fizzle, want to miss it. <laughs> if it's not a fizzle, you want to see it, right? right. If, it, if it happens and we get a thousand an hour, you want to, even if it's a thousand an hour, so that's. Even that's, if it's 10 an hour, you're going to want to see it. A thousand an hour is going to be what? 60 a minute, you know? One uh, every second. A thousand an hour. That's going to be, it's, it's going to be 10, 10 a second. 1,000. So let's see. Divided by 60. And Scott and Kent do math. That's 16. That's 16 a minute. Divided by 60. 16.6 a minute. 16.66. So let's six, just say, six, let's six, just six, say 20. Let's yeah, just say 20 a minute. Satanic yeah. number. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just say 20 a minute, between 15 and 20 a minute. That'll be cool. Everybody gets to watch Kent and Scott do math with our fingers and toes. Right. About so every three or four seconds, you're going to see one. Yeah. So this comes you'll down. You'll probably see multiples at once, too. But, but they're going to be slow moving, and you're going to have to have a dark sight to see them because they're not going to be big, bright, obvious ones. You're, and the another part of the, what makes this, that's the night of the new moon, Scott. And so... Perfect. Uh, it's perfect. You have no moon and it's going to be perfect. It's going to be perfect. And it's the 31st, which is a weeknight. If I remember, it's Monday night. 
Yes, the night, Monday night. So we're all going to be up bleary eyed. So, uh, so where are you going to go Monday night, Ken? I don't know. I will have just gotten back from a camping trip. Uh, so I'll probably, I may go he- head up to Todd Longnecker's house, um, you know, and then so, step. So Lubo in China says, what's the chance of a meteor storm destroying the International Space Station or some of Musk's satellites? Um, probably low chance because the cometary grains coming off of a comet that make these beautiful meteor showers are tiny. They're like sizes of a grain of sand. And smaller. Okay. And smaller. And smaller. Yeah. yeah, they're just coming in so fast that they ionize in the atmosphere and create that streak. Bolides, however, and bigger, you know. Uh, thumb sized, thumb sized rocks and bigger. Yeah. You know, that, can, that could damage some things. But, you know, uh, micrometeorite going, you know, 200, you know, 200 kilometers an hour or whatever the speed is, you know, it'll go through a lot of stuff and punch holes. But, you know, that's one of these reasons that have driven the increased forecasting so they can know when these storms are coming and take steps to protect the satellites, uh, in this case, the International Space Station, by minimizing its uh, profile to the radiant of the incoming comets or uh, okay. incoming meteors. So that's one thing that's really driven the increased forecasting ability. Now, so now the International Space Station has been hit by space junk, so mm-hmm. to speak, and um, uh, it says that, that uh, by fast moving debris didn't cause too much damage, though space junk hurtling towards the space station smashed into one of its robotic arms, leaving a hole. Okay, if that was your spacesuit, yeah, you're you're probably a goner. Okay. Um, but uh, it was the Canada arm, too, that got the damage. Uh, it left a gaping hole in the section of the arm boom and thermal blanket. Uh, according to NASA, over 23,000 objects the size of a softball or larger are being tracked by the U.S. Department of Defense at all times to monitor for possible collisions with satellites and the International Space Station. However, small objects that can't be tracked still pose a threat, like rocks, dust particles, Flex of paint that chip off the satellites. Bolts, so things like that. Yeah. Exactly. Exploding yeah. bolts and stuff from uh, yeah, from you know, or, or there's been bolts lost by astronauts. They're put on it, it goes drifting away. Uh seems like there's a hammer or a wrench that got lost on the ISS at some point. So the comet is 73P Schwashman Wachman, uh SW3. Um is its shorthand. It's a Short period comet, 5.4 years. Uh, it was observed in 1930, but it's so faint it wasn't observed again until the 1970s. Um, but in the mid-90s, on one, one pass, it became 600 times brighter than previous observations. Uh, the comet had broken up at some point during its orbit, orbit leaving debris in its own path through the solar system uh, by 2006, astronomers had counted 70 pieces, and it's likely to continue to break up over the last 16 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Earth is going to go through the debris field. Uh, they just can't predict exactly what's going to happen uh, because so little is known about the orbit. However, if things were ejected at just the right angle and just the right speed, hopefully we're going to have just something to just fawn over on tuesday morning so um i may be in late tuesday morning scott uh if i stay up till one one thirty two o'clock i may drag in a wee little bit late so uh so so for people in the united states uh that's 10 4 p.m uh pacific time daylight time uh 11 p.m mountain time Midnight Central Time and 104 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time uh, would be much the same for our Canadian friends and uh, friends down in Mexico as well. So North America is the bullseye. You know, it's hope beyond hope, and probably, but I, by God, I'm going to stay up. Having seen one, I want the chance to see another fairly decent meteor storm. So, anyway. 
That's what I've got today, Scott. That's you. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's see if we have any good questions here from our audience. I hope m many of you guys do get to see that um, that meteor shower if it comes off well. Um, there was some conversation about uh, camera lenses and um, camera companies. Ken Noble says, if you're looking for a focal length and ease of use, which is more similar to, to a telephoto lens, I would go with a Maxitoff Cassegrain. Maxitoff Cassegrains are, are used. They, they were not very popular as camera lenses, though. A lot of, a number of camera companies, including Canon and Nikon, made Maxitoff type uh, um, or Cassegrain type uh, telephoto lenses. Uh, but the, the dioptic. Yeah, the F ratio is a little slow. The ones that I use that were not designed for astronomy, but used for designed for camera use, uh, were not very sharp, not very contrasty, you know. So, um, but still expensive. <laughs> yes, they were catadioptic, and I crave, I, I, I craved one. And ended up borrowing one of the guys one, and I was like, going, eh, you know, the focal yeah. length was so long. It's cool. It's only that big, you know. Yeah, but... it was two thousand millimeters, or sure. and try trying to handhold that, like an F eleven you know? or an F twelve or something. Or yeah, and you're having you're maybe. having to shoot at the fastest shutter speed you could get, which because it didn't have a it, it didn't it had a fixed iris in it, right. you know, or, or a two it was it was F eight and F sixteen or something like that. And so, GM and Christmas, you're having to push Tri-X to 3200, and to get a 500th of a second, you know, shutter speed, it just wasn't wasn't worth it. Right. A couple of telescope companies made uh, Maxutov type um, uh, spotting scopes slash camera lenses slash telescopes, and so the Celestron C90 was one of them, very popular. Had a you know, twist, uh, helical focus, and then Mead's 97E, um, uh, 90 millimeter Maxitov, basically a copy of, of the uh, Celestron unit. Um, they were both very popular lenses used by Drug Enforcement Agency and, and uh, you know, for spy work as well, you know, the police, police units use them. They were rare, very rugged. Uh, medium size aperture uh, and uh, did work out very nicely as camera lenses and spotting scopes. So you might still find one of those out there used if you're looking for something like that. Um, Mike Wiesner says, my first telescope was an Evidence Scientific 3-inch Newtonian, a Christmas present from my mom in 61. I still have it and still occasionally use it. Um, you'll me. have to bring it out to the Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. We'll have to see how, how faint it can go. Paul Burgart says, my first telescope was a four and a quarter Evans Scientific. That was big aperture, dude. Uh, it was a Newtonian. Also have mine. Fun to fool with now and then. Well, you guys have me both beat because I just have a little 40 millimeter. But, um, uh, but I have looked at deep sky objects with my 40, and I have looked, of course, at the moon and planets with it. So Paul Burgart says uh, uh, that uh, I lusted for a Questar. And Bergman Scooter says the Comet Hunter, that's the Explorer Scientific, the Comet Hunter is still the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, but uh, I hope you guys had fun today. I uh, hope you had fun watching the uh, Gilbert, um, uh, you know, telescope. It must have been a television commercial, I imagine. Hey, hey Scott, yeah. why don't you provide the link in the chat? Because the sound wasn't real good, so they may That's not have been able link. to hear it. This is, I actually had the video. Where did you get it from? Archive.org. <laughs> so you pulled it out, so, so they would have to I, go to archive.org. I archive. the org. original file from Archive. Cool. Yeah, if I rebroadcast it, it would be even worse, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, but if you want to find the original video, it's about 10 minutes long. It covers microscopes and all the stuff that Gilbert made uh, back then uh, in, what, 63 or yeah. 61, whenever it was made. I, I had a director set, loved it. Right. Now, I was probably in the early 70s, so it was probably the erector set. What what was it you said? It was it was the erector set by Gilbert Design or something like that, AC right? AC Gilbert Company. Yeah. And their Hall of Science. That's That was uh, something that... Uh, the that, Hall uh, of Science. The Hall of Science. In fact, I will play the whole video for you. Here we go. Let's see. This is from 1963, folks. AC Gilbert. Turn your volume way up to hear it. And we shouldn't talk, Scott, or we'll deafen them. We live in an age of science. Their first scientific... This year at Gilbert... We present the finest toy line in our history. This is our story. This is Zoom. And this is the most spectacular microscope ever made. This new Gilbert Zoom microscope is the most versatile in its field, with more than a dozen outstanding features. In addition to conventional viewing, it permits 180 degrees swing around for close-ups of a delicate flower, for example. For detailed viewing of small objects, this adaptable microscope zooms down instantly. No other microscope does so much, has so much. Heavyweight all-metal construction. This set features an all-new metal microscope that magnifies up to 450 times. Has electric plug-in lighting and smooth gear drive focusing action. Viewing versatility at its best is offered with this microscope. While this set also includes complete professional equipment. Both sets feature the Gilbert all-metal electric zoom microscope. Changing from bottom lighting to top lighting is a thing. Takes but an instant. This set offers the greatest range of focusing power ever. 1,000 times actual size, plus many other features. A professional laboratory beauty with binocular eyepiece included with this steel cabinet set. And this separate sail outfit. For viewing versatility, a handy light selector. Three is a crowd, but not when there's a Gilbert group viewer attachment. With the big enlargement screen, we can all have a look. Gilbert physics sets provide endless hours of fun in learning about the laws of nature. Typical of the apparatus is this optical bench that can project an image, reflect and bend light rays, or, like the rainbow, produce the entire breathtaking spectrum of color. Materials like human beings become tired. And this fatigue shows up as shimmering stress patterns made visible by polarized light in this optical bench experiment. The spinning veins of the radiometer are a dramatic demonstration of how the sun can provide an endless supply of power. Gilbert physics sets are available at three price levels and are recommended for children eight years and older. The most famous name in toys is known throughout the world. Erector, the all-steel construction set, 
for beginners, for young builders, for junior engineers. Four generations of American youth have grown up with Erector, the toy that has become as much a part of our life as baseball and hot dogs. Erector has exciting appeal for all boys. Because its solid steel parts build solid steel models. As many as a thousand from just one set. Erector battery motors put action into models like this. While this rugged power plant with four position gear shift drives an Erector printing press. Radar warns of enemy attack. Quickly, Erector's rocket launcher goes into action. Nothing beats the fun of a roller coaster, and this one is a beauty, built with the largest Erector set in the line. Erector offers the most complete line of construction sets ever made. This radar scanner set is followed in the line by the outfit that features the exciting rocket launcher. Every boy has a natural curiosity about electricity. What makes the lights go on? Why does a motor run? How does a battery store energy? Gilbert electrical engineering sets provide the answers. First step in building a motor is winding the armature. And this boy is rediscovering a basic fact of science. That through a system of coils and magnets, electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy that can do a thousand useful things. Gilbert's electrical engineering line offers four complete sets, each packed in an attractive display box, crammed with parts, apparatus, and equipment. For the line that's really stacked, stock Gilbert. Electrical engineering. Chemistry, the foundation of all scientific advance. Practiced by the ancients thousands of years ago, steeped in mysticism and superstition, Developed by modern science, chemistry is today a fascinating adventure for youth of all ages. Gilbert has made this exciting science available in safe and easy to understand form. The mark of a chemistry set is the number and variety of different experiments it will do. And Gilbert outfits have no equal here. All Gilbert sets are laboratory tested and approved, made as completely safe as human ingenuity can devise. For even the junior chemist, Gilbert sets are designed for fun, as typified by this starter outfit. A complete home laboratory in a steel cabinet. Most of all, Gilbert chemistry sets are designed for fun. The fun of discovery, the fun of doing, the fun of achievement. The array of chemicals in this lower price set makes it one of the big values in the line. Gilbert, finest name in chemistry. More than 300 years ago, Galileo invented the telescope and brought man and the stars closer together. For today's young scientist, this Gilbert 60 power spotting telescope has features Galileo never thought of, including an image that's right side up. A new addition to the Gilbert family of telescopes, this beauty can bring in close-ups of aircraft, birds, or ships at sea. The 40-power telescope in this attractive box has a reflecting lens system for overhead viewing and a steel mounting clamp. This 60-power reflecting telescope brings in close-up views of the moon and its craters, of Mars, Jupiter, and Venus. With its rack and pinion focusing system, images are razor sharp. Queen of the Gilbert astronomy line is this 80 power deluxe telescope that brings new excitement to space travel. The world of electronics is the world of radar and sonar, of guided missiles and television and countless other wonders. It is also the world of Gilbert electronic sets. These tiny precision parts, resistors, capacitors, diodes, 
potentiometers are the same as those used in satellite guidance systems and giant computers. Easy to follow templates and numbered parts make electronic buildings fun for all ages and quick too. In just 10 minutes, these youngsters will put together a complete working radio. One of the outstanding electronic features is the Jiffy Clip that permits instant snap-on connection. As each part assembles on the template, the circuit swiftly grows, swiftly takes shape. As many as 15 different radio sets and circuits can be built with a single Gilbert electronic outfit. Gilbert's balanced electronic line includes a beginner's set that requires no electricity. Thank you. 